AMD's hotly anticipated third-generation Ryzen is on the horizon. The processors PC gamers have looked forward to for months, if not years, is but days away. By the time you watch this, they may have already launched. In recognition, here's a reminder of why the PC community put so much stock in Ryzen, the first generation. It's early 2017. For a better part of a decade, Intel has conditioned the PC market into paying more than $300 for a 4-core, 8-thread processor. A lack of increase in core count could have been excused if each generation brought a substantial improvement in performance. But that wasn't the case. It had been more than half a decade since Intel's last leap, 2011 Sandy Bridge, which incidentally was also the last generation to solder their integrated heat spreader. More on that in a moment. Since Sandy Bridge, any improvement in performance the subsequent generations brought was incremental at best. To make matters worse, Intel switched their thermal interface material from Sandy Bridge's solder to a substandard paste for Ivy Bridge in later generations, a downgrade that enthusiasts complained severely impacted thermals and overclockability. Indeed, a few enthusiasts even went to the trouble of deleting their processor in order to remove Intel's material and substitute it with a premium paste or even liquid metal. This is a dangerous procedure that can potentially destroy the CPU if it isn't performed properly. Nevertheless, enthusiasts deem it necessary to unlock the processor's overclocking potential. In cases like Coffee Lake though, the 8700K ran so hot at stock that de-litting was a choice worth considering even without any overclock. This prompted Intel to return to soldering with the generation that followed, but more on that in a moment. Why did Coffee Lake run so hot it forced Intel to return to a process they had abandoned for more than half a decade? Coffee Lake used six cores, a 50% increase over preceding generation's four cores. When one looks at it this way, it's easy to see why consumers saw a rise in temperature with the 8700K. That's two more cores using additional power and pumping out additional heat. So that raises the question, what prompted Intel to improve the core count on their mainstream processors? They had been happy to sit on four cores for the better part of a decade and it conditioned their consumers to accept this status quo. What changed? Ryzen. After having all but disappeared from the CPU market, AMD returned in 2017, offering a lineup of processors with core counts that put Intel's entire catalogue to shame. Even the mid-range 1600 Ryzen sported six cores and 12 threads, a 50% lead over Intel's consumer flagship i7-7700K. Against the i5-7600K, Intel's competitor at the same price point, the 1600 and 1600X, had 50% more physical cores and thrice as many threads. Ryzer 1700 fared even better in comparisons to competitors with 8 cores and 16 threads. Twice that of Intel's i7-7700K, a processor that cost $20 more than the 1700. To nobody's surprise, AMD's lead in cores and threads allowed Ryzen to trounce Intel in content creation and productivity workloads, though this wasn't the case in gaming benchmarks. Ryzen hadn't quite caught up to Intel in frequency or instructions per cycle two metrics that matter a great deal in game performance. Admittedly, AMD had achieved a remarkable 52% uplift in IPC over their previous excavator core, but this wasn't enough to catch up to contemporary competition from Intel's i7s, at least when it came to single-threaded applications like older games. Intel's i5 and i7 still remained a marginally better choice for gamers, but not for long. TechSpot revisited the subject in 2019, retesting Ryzen 1600 with its contemporary competition, the Intel i5-7600K, which struggled in multiple titles due to its lack of hyperthreading. It feels ironic when one recalls reading the common advice of, buy an i5 if you just want to play games. 7600K buyers must be regretting their purchase now, less so for consumers who bought the 7700K, which still holds up, though it's unclear for how long. Ryzen, for its part, seems to have come a long way in gaming performance. Perhaps developers have learned to optimise for it, tweak their games to make use of the massive multi-threaded performance on offer. This doesn't change the fact that Ryzen at its launch was a compromise. Consumers sacrificed some smoothness in gameplay for significantly better productivity. AMD had gone all in on core counts, and it worked. Consumers finally had an alternative, 
Intel finally had competition to force them to stop their stagnation and offer better products or cheaper prices. To that end, a price cut was Intel's first response to Ryzen's release. i5s had their price reduced by 70 to 90 US dollars, while the mainstream i7s received a 90 to 140 US dollar price cut. The high-end desktop i7s had their prices slashed hundreds of dollars. This wouldn't be the last time AMD's products had forced Intel to drop their prices. Sources within motherboard manufacturers said the impending launch of Ryzen 3000 series had spooked Intel into slashing the insane prices of their ninth generation i7s by 10 to 15%. To be fair, Intel is but one of two companies that have been forced to offer better value for the consumer. But more on that later. Cheaper prices on Intel's quad cores did not go far enough to provide an alternative to first generation Ryzen's incredible multi-threaded performance. An unprecedented challenge that could only be met with a competitive product. Intel had just the answer. Coffee Lake. With six cores and 12 threads, Intel quickly neutralized Ryzen's lead in multi-threaded performance with the 8700K. Coffee Lake never quite matched Ryzen purely in the number of threads and physical cores, but it didn't need to. With a 50% improvement in core count over KB Lake, Coffee Lake represented Intel's first notable generational improvement since Sandy Bridge six years prior. Some speculate Intel had planned to move their mainstream processors to six cores anyway. Maybe, maybe not. Even if this is the case, it's clear Ryzen forced them to release it early and price it reasonably. Had AMD never launched Ryzen, Intel might have used a lack of competition to preserve four core CPUs as a mainstream offering and segment the 6-core processor at a higher price as they did with the 8-core 9900K. But again, more on that in a moment. That said, Coffee Lake brought no improvement in single-threaded performance, but it didn't need to. Ryzen still had some catching up to do in that department as the 8700K continued to hold a substantial lead in applications like Photoshop, browser benchmarks and even a X265 encoding. Though Ryzen was competitive at encoding the older X264 standard, AMD responded to the 8700K with the second generation Ryzen in 2018. The flagship 2700X retook the performance crown in X265 and 7-zip compression while consolidating Ryzen's lead in decompression. Though it still lost to the 8700K in WinRAR compression, Photoshop, browser benchmarks and gaming performance. This may have been mitigated by the fact that at $330 US dollars, the 2700X did launch at a cheaper price than Ryzen's first generation 1700X. Given the fact the 2700X wasn't quite the game changer as predecessor was, Intel's response to second generation Ryzen was peculiar. The Coffee Lake refresh. Intel's ninth generation was notable for a number of reasons. Some good, some bad, and some plain weird. For one, the 9000 series brought a welcome, if not long overdue return to soldering, which Intel made sure to tout in their marketing materials. <laughs> that was a marketing point? It sounds more like a patch note. Look at this awesome new thing we developed for our gamers, except it's not new at all. You used to do it years ago and you didn't brag about it then. But never mind that now. It is good you returned, even though it might not have brought the intended benefit as a few testers observed the 9900K running hotter than the 8700K. Some speculated the increase in temperature is caused by the 9900K's PCB and metal die being thicker than usual. Another factor to consider is the 9900K having 50% more cores and threads than the 8700K. This was reflected in a substantial price hike and a new designation, i9. Perhaps Intel should have given the 9700K a new designation while they're at it. Why? The 9700K marked the first time a new CPU could have been argued to be a downgrade to the predecessor it was supposed to replace. The 9700K did not have the hyper-threading the 8700K and older i7s have always had. Though, to be fair, the 9700K did have two more cores than its 6-core, 12-threaded predecessor. While the 9700K did outperform the 8700K thanks to slightly faster frequencies, the decreasing number of threads did make the 9700K slower than its predecessor in certain applications. This could have been excused had Intel created a new segment, say the i6, and a cheaper price to reflect reduced performance in certain scenarios. But this wasn't the case. The 9700K launched at a price premium over the 8700K, despite being the first i7 to be slower than its predecessor in certain applications. And to be fair, 
Intel is not the only company to use unintuitive naming schemes. AMD is also guilty of this. Look at their GPU generations. HD 7970, R9 R9390, R9 which was just a rehash. Fury, RX 480, Vega, RX 5700. <laughs> what the hell? The first switch from 7970 to R9290 is understandable. They only had two generations left on the old naming scheme, 8970 and 9970. Switching to R900s would have given them eight generations. The 390 rehash was just sad. Reusing an older chip in a new generation is understandable. Naming it in the same tier is not. If the 290 had to be reused, it should have been named the 380. This would have allowed the new flagship to be named the 390 and so on. This is what Nvidia did when they recycled the GTX 680 to be the GTX 770. Instead, AMD named their flagship Fury X. Their next flagship was named Vega. Why didn't AMD just stick with the X90 naming scheme? It was simple and easy to understand. If you were in the market for a new fridge, you'd probably guess a hypothetical PF89 was a tier above the PF62. You'd have a significantly harder time if the products were named Apple and Carrot, which is what Vega and Fury are to consumers new to the PC platform. You might correctly point out this difficulty does not apply to most PC gamers who have already familiarized themselves with the hardware industry. But this still does not explain why AMD switched from RX 500 to RX 5700 XT. Where did that come from? Why can't we just go 1A, 1B, 1C, then the next generation, 2A, 2B, 2C? Everyone understands that. This might seem trivial, but consistent naming would go a long way in helping a broader audience understand your products and where they stack up. Say what you will about Nvidia but any novice might guess the GTX 980 is probably better than the GTX 280. Speaking of which, the GTX 280 was also the herald of a change in Nvidia's nomenclature from the old 8800s and 9800 GTX. The GTX 280 is also an example of Nvidia's pricing gone haywire and serves as a reminder of AMD's importance as a competitor and an alternative. When Nvidia launched the GTX 280 on June 17, 2008, they were the first to hit that performance mark and price the 280 at an insane 650 US dollars. The GTX 260 was priced at 450 US dollars, unjustifiably expensive for a mid-range card. Just eight days later, AMD, whose graphics division went by ATI at the time, launched the Radeon HD 4870, a card that nipped at the heels of the GTX 280 but cost less than half the price. At 300 US dollars, the 4870 was also faster than Nvidia's $450 GTX 260. Nvidia responded to the competition by dropping the $300 GeForce 9800 GTX to $200, the GTX 260 down from $450 to $300, and cut the price of the flagship GTX 280 from $650 to $500. This wouldn't be the last time Nvidia were forced to offer cheaper prices. History repeated itself five years later with the GTX 700 series. In May 2013, Nvidia launched the GTX 780 at $650, exactly the same price they had launched the GTX 280 at back in 2008. Three months earlier, Nvidia had launched the first Titan at an eye-watering $1,000, though they justified this insane price by pitching the Titan as a prosumer card. Nvidia could do this because AMD at the time did not have any product that could compete with the 780's performance, but that was about to change. In October 2013, AMD launched the R9 290X, a $550 card that outstripped Nvidia's $1,000 Titan. Shortly after, AMD launched the R9 290, a $400 card that was faster than Nvidia's $650 GTX 780, while also packing an additional gigabyte of VRAM. Nvidia realized their GPUs were now a terrible proposition and cut the GTX 780's price down to $500 exactly as they had done with the GTX 280 back in 2008. This wasn't sufficient, as the 290 was still a better purchase and the 290X was still the fastest card. Nvidia reclaimed the performance crown by launching the GTX 780 Ti at $700, a price that was poor value for money considering the GTX 780 Ti was still one gigabyte short of the 290's four gigabytes of VRAM. The 290's weren't perfect either. They ran extremely loud and extremely hot, Frequently reaching 94 degrees centigrade, the poor acoustic and thermal performance was blamed on AMD's abysmal reference cooler. 
Sadly, it took months for this issue to subside as aftermarket cards started popping up on the market only in early 2014. While these custom cooled cards did run cooler than the furnace that was a reference 290X, most of these were priced at $700, an insane markup over the reference $550. Only the ASUS DC2 was priced reasonably at $600. While $700 may have made the aftermarket 290X poor value for money, buyers who purchased them anyway won out in the long run, as the 290X aged much better than the 780 and the 780Ti. This is not the case for subsequent Radeons, as the 290X seems to have been AMD's last good generation. Nvidia understood this, as they counted the 290X with the GTX 900 series, the last generation to be priced reasonably. Launching in September 2014, the $550 GTX 980 and $330 GTX 970 quickly rendered the 290X irrelevant. AMD's response was pitiful. Rebadging the 290X with double the VRAM to serve as a 390X. Though the 390X was clocked slightly faster than the 290X, it arrived in June 2015, far too late to compete with the GTX 980. Furthermore, this was a month NVIDIA had set a new standard for high-end performance with the flagship GTX 980 Ti. AMD weren't quite as slow to respond as they were with the 390X, but the response didn't quite measure up. The 4GB Fury X. This $650 Radeon cost the same as NVIDIA's 980 Ti, but lost to the GeForce at every resolution. Furthermore, the Fury X had two fewer gigabytes of VRAM than the 980 Ti, Though a few might argue AMD's high bandwidth memory made up for this deficiency. AMD pitched the Fury X as an overclocker's dream, bragging, you'll be able to overclock this thing like no tomorrow. This claim didn't hold up as most reviewers only managed to squeeze a 7% overclock on the core frequency. The high bandwidth memory couldn't be overclocked at all. Ironically, overclocker's dream could be used to describe the Fury X's competitor, Nvidia's 980 Ti. Reviewers of the 980 Ti were able to push a 26% overclock on the core clock and 18% on the memory. Based on the fact that even a stock clocked 980 Ti was faster than the Fury X, an overclocked 980 Ti should be in an entirely different league. AMD knew this and they had weeks to reconsider the Fury X's price before launch. And yet they decided to price the Fury X exactly the same as their faster, cooler and more overclockable competition. <laughs> what gives? That's what we'll explore in our analysis of price fixing. So please like, subscribe and press the bell icon so you don't miss out. A number of subscribers have reported YouTube does not notify them of new uploads, even with the bell enabled. New videos will also be announced on Twitter, so please follow us over there too. Link is in the comments and the description below. If you found this interesting, please share this video to spread the word.